Goats here at Church on the Go. And, and I'm Pastor Curtis. And here's my wife, Jenny. So Hello. we bless you and we welcome you tonight to follow along in our uh, live stream and our study. We have been teaching on the kingdom of God and we have been reading through uh, Dr. Miles Monroe's uh, book called Rediscovering the Kingdom. And we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, we've also been referring to um, the whole teaching of spirit, soul, and body. And uh, this is by Andrew Womack, and this one is by uh, Miles Monroe. If you want to look up and get more teaching on those topics, you can find them on, both on YouTube. Although Miles Monroe has passed on now, a number of years ago, he was uh, tragically killed in a plane crash. Right. So, um, but all the material is still up on YouTube. Um, so we have been uh, studying that, and you'll see some of the graphics uh, on the Google Drive. Yeah, you, yep. you just have that link on the description of the Facebook live stream. Uh, one of the links is for the PDF book that we will be reading from later. The other graphic, the link, other link is for graphics that we will be referring to on our TV screen here. But you can look at them on your own split screen if you want, and have a closer look at them. And they're also on Facebook as well. So, so um, this past Thursday, uh, we had been sharing about eternal salvation. And we've been talking about uh, you in God and God in you. And um, along with uh, what we've been teaching um, with uh, the whole aspect of the kingdom of God, and the uh, spirit, soul, and body. You know, Jesus mentions in Luke 17 that uh, the kingdom of God is within us, right? Yes. And uh, and so we need to understand how that actually works itself out practically, and that's what we've been trying to explain. Mm -hmm. So uh, I began sharing about eternal salvation. Now, uh, I caution everybody that it's not eternal security, it's eternal salvation. <laughs> right. And there are a number of characteristics uh, that have to do with eternal salvation, and Curtis is going to share one here that has to do with the eternal purpose. Yes. So if you want to turn with us in your Bibles to Ephesians 3, uh, 10, 11, and 12. Ephesians 3, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, it's really in 11, but for context, there's more here. So to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Amen. So the eternal purpose is the big picture. It's the yes. macro. That's right. That's right. You know, the, the, the big purpose is really uh, what God is doing. Uh, There's in, lots of parts to it. Yeah, in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, saving us is, is uh, part of that. We're going to get into that next. But, um, you know, and it mentions there that we have confidence by the faith of him. And so it's not by our faith, but it's by his faith. It's by Christ's faith. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, you know, we're tapping into all that he um, deposits in us. I've been sharing the fact that, uh, if you want to go to the big uh, graphic there, Curtis, yeah, um, that when we receive Christ in our spirit, which is the heart, yep. or the core of your being, the old King James says belly, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that we receive, you know, the kingdom of God, the faith of God, the love of God, the power of God, the anointing of God. <laughs> All these things are given to us by the Spirit of God. Right. The Spirit which we have in us, you know. And uh, we've referred in the past to 1 Corinthians 6 and 17. It says that uh, uh, they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. So it's like our spirit becomes welded to His spirit, right? Yes. And uh, and so we've been sharing uh, about that. So 
This passage here that Curtis has been sharing uh, has to do with the eternal purpose in Christ. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add to that? Uh, well, I think everybody wants a purpose. Yes. Mm -hmm. and I, I think that's one of the core crises, crises that's out in the world today. Nobody knows their purpose. Yeah. yeah. And when they you see, you get it's, you get upset with these young people doing stupid things, yeah. turning over whatever shopping carts writing graffiti on wall. It's because they don't know their purpose. Right. They're really crying out for a purpose in life, and so they get bored with life, and they do all kinds of crazy things. We get upset with them, but really, they need to be told, hey, you have a higher purpose. Yeah. You, there's something better for you out there. And it's or, eternal. And it's eternal, yeah. right? Then, if they want to know more, then we get into the other parts of the eternal, yeah, right? Yeah, other, yeah. Like eternal salvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it starts with the fact that God has a purpose, an eternal purpose, and it includes you and me. Right. right. So give people hope, rather Amen. than just being cross with them all the time. Yeah. Amen. Just say, hey, guess what? You actually have a reason for existing. Amen. Amen. So that's great. So I uh, want to share with you five eternal thoughts or characteristics or attributes about eternal salvation having an eternal purpose is one of them. Mm -hmm. The second one is the phrase eternal salvation. If you'd like to read that, Jen, sure. it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Again, we could read other verses around it for context, but in order to, to make it a little more compact, we'll just yep. stick with the actual verse. Uh, so Hebrews 5 and 9 there. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Right. So, thank you. So, being made perfect, he had to go through suffering is what the context is talking mm -hmm. about now. And that the suffering that he went through brought him to a place of maturity or perfection, right? Yeah. Um, he became the author of eternal salvation. So this salvation that Jesus accomplished for us is for all people for all time, yes. right? You know, Jesus is not going to die again, right? No. Nope. <laughs> he went to the cross once, and it's the finished work of the cross, right? That's right. Uh, the completed work of the cross. Um, and then it goes on and says, uh, unto all them that obey him. The, the word that obey him uh, in the Greek, it actually means that those who yield to him, those who surrender to him, those who uh, follow him, those who give heed to him. Um, so, you know, when you think of a vehicle merging onto a highway, you have to yield to the oncoming traffic, right? And so that's like us. We're... We're coming onto the highway. Jesus is the highway, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he, it's already running, and we have to yield to him, yeah. right, yeah. as we come onto the highway, right? And, and the first step of obeying him is believing what right. he did on Absolutely. the cross. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. <clears throat> so he's the author of eternal salvation. So uh, those that obey him. So if you yield to him, surrender to him, uh, then uh, you can be a participant in eternal salvation. Um, is there anything else? Oh, Michael says hi. Hello, Michael. Blessings, blessings. 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 Uh, if there's nothing else to add there, we'll go on to uh, chapter 9 in Hebrews. Sure. And uh, Jenny, if you want to um, pick up uh, verses 12 to 15, there's three more <coughs> eternals in there. All right. <laughs> We've got eternal purpose, eternal salvation, yeah. all right? Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a, of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, uh, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Verse 50. Oh, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, 
that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yes. So, under the first covenant, or the old covenant, people weren't born again. So, uh, the blood that was shed of bulls and goats and, and so forth um, simply appeased or, or covered until the time of Christ, right? Right. And um, he has entered now uh, into the holy place, that is the holy place is, is in heaven, the most holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. So, of course, the word redemption is to redeem. It's an eternal work. He's not going to do it again. He's not going to shed his blood again. <laughs> nope. It's once for Although all. Although there are a few uh, evangelicals around that keep talking about this uh, third uh, Jewish temple and uh, the, the, the red heifer the red and all heifer. that business. Yeah, I did a lesson on that a while ago. Jesus yeah. fulfills the red heifer process. Oh, absolutely. He was our red heifer. Guys, you missed it. Yeah, I mean, what are you staring this, over there for? Blood of bulls and goats is yes yeah. past. Yeah, right? it's all past. He it, finished it, it. You know, he completed the sacrifice when he died on the cross. Yeah, that's right. It was done. It's finished. Done. Finished. Yeah. So whatever they do now, that's in spite of what Jesus did. Yeah, yeah. it's Anathema. really anathema. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Sorry, Jenny. I think oh. I cut you off. oh, that's good. I was just saying it's not even necessary. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. not yeah. necessary. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And the eternal spirit there, it says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, uh, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So I'm going to take a moment to explain this one. It's a little more complicated. You see in that graphic that's on the screen, or if you are on the Google Drive, you can pull the, that up. Yep. And you notice that the white ring is dealing with the soul. So the soul, of course, it, it talks about here purging your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So the soul is where your conscience is, right? Yep. It, it's made up of your mind, that's your brain. Okay, your mind, your will, that's your ability to make choices, your emotions, that's the high and low points of your life, your personality, which would include your conscience, right? So it is the Spirit of God that we receive when, you know, the Spirit enters into our heart, and um, it's only as the Spirit of God impacts your soul from your heart. So it really uh, begins as you transfer Form your mind, you renew your mind with the Word of God, right? Yes. It's the Word and the Spirit uh, doing that work of renewing the mind and uh, bringing transformation there. And He begins to purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We know that these things that we've been, you know, interested in in the past really have no value. Yeah, the conscience being in the soul realm. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. So, and that's a process. Mm -hmm. You know, when you set them aside, you know, uh, we begin to put more focus on the realm of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And it's only as we're baptized in the Holy Spirit that the Spirit of God is able to move beyond that whole realm of our spirit and soul to through our body to others, ministering to others, you know. Yes. So your soul is either, it's like a filter, it's like um, an air filter or a water filter. Only as um, the Spirit of God is, is moving freely through your soul are you able to minister to others. True. Because your soul could be all cluttered up with all kinds of confusing ideas and mm -hmm. thoughts that restrict the flowing of the Spirit. And so therefore you're not very effective. That's right. Kind of like a clogged artery, artery or something. The blood doesn't go as fast because yeah. it goes through a tiny opening. Yeah. Right? And if Jesus needed the, to be baptized before he entered into ministry. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So do we. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned that this morning mm -hmm. as we were going through Matthew chapter 3 and uh, mentioned the fact that Jesus 
was baptized in the Holy Spirit before he entered into ministry. In fact, no miracle was recorded in Scripture prior to about uh, Jesus doing it, prior to the Spirit of God coming upon him and the Father speaking and saying, "This is my beloved Son; hear ye him." Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And uh, if you remember, uh, uh, Satan tried to tempt him to do a miracle in the wilderness. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you really are the Son of God, yeah. then turn these stones to bread. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And he countered with, well, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from yeah. the mouth of God. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, I wonder if that's connected, because Jesus knew not to perform any miracles before that. Uh, it probably, he re had received the, you know, I mean, Jesus was perfect, okay. His He's spirit perfect. was perfect. But yeah. it's a principle that Jesus, first of all, he went and had water baptism. He said to John the mm. Baptist, this is to fulfill all righteousness. Yes. Um, and he had the Father, you know, announced him. And, the dove came down on And him. the Spirit of God fell upon him yeah. before he actually went out. And that, it was after that that he went into the wilderness, right? So. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, that's true. Yes. I so got when he right. went into the wilderness, he obviously had the... You know the fullness of the That's spirit, true. Yeah. and the scripture actually says in John chapter three that he had the spirit without limit or without mm -hmm. measure, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and we can have the spirit just the same as Jesus had, according to First John chapter four and verse seventeen. We'll come to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. But um, so uh, only as the eternal spirit is taking. You know, moving through your soul and body, you know, uh, is your conscience purged from dead works to serve the living God. Amen. You have anything you want to add? No. Okay. Very good. All right. So then uh, we have the eternal inheritance, right? That's in verse 15. So. Uh, oh, hello, Carol. I just wanted to say hi to Carol. She's I said hello to Carol. Us. Good to have you with us. So uh, we can receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Uh, that eternal inheritance, we won't take the time, but you can find more uh, on that in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, where it says that we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Right. right. So uh, that inheritance is part of the kingdom of God that's functioning in and through us. Right? True. Um, we have royal potential. Yeah. Right? We do. <laughs> and we have to learn to press into the kingdom of God, right? That's right. Uh, if you, you know, become complacent and apathetic, you, you know, you're just sitting back, um, you know, uh, in that case, you will not be as effective as we could be in the mm -hmm. kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, Curtis, did you want to read for us here? Sure. Philemon 1 and 6. All right, Philemon. Right before Hebrews is Philemon. Yeah. A little tiny book. Uh, verse 6. Just one chapter, verse 6. Okay. Uh, so you want to turn with us to Philemon, verse 6. It says, That the communication of thy faith may become effectual, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Right. That okay. would be a very long list. Yeah. You can There's only give away what good you have. Thing. Yeah. That's you can a long only give list. Away what you yeah. Have. yeah. Yeah. Right. Or even what you know you have. Yeah. yeah. Like you might have a million dollars in the bank. Yeah. But if you don't know you have it, do you think you're spending it? <laughs> Well, when you begin to think of all the attributes and qualities that are given to you with the eternal salvation, yeah. and when you have received the eternal spirit into your spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have access to the anointing and the faith and the love and the power of God yeah. uh, in your life. And um, uh, so as you acknowledge that, your the communication of your faith becomes more effective. That's like turning on the tap. Mm -hmm. yeah. Turning on the faucet and allowing the water to flow out of yeah, the tap, absolutely, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The more you know that you have, the more... Uh, in fact, one of the things I was sharing this morning, uh, Colossians 1 and 27, uh, and I mentioned that, um, you know, 
this morning when I was waking up, the Holy Spirit was reminding me about this verse. And uh, you have it in I do, it? Yeah. Colossians one twenty six. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right. So, you know, I told the folks this morning, I said, you need to own that verse, and mm. especially that last phrase, Yeah. that today Christ is in me, the hope of glory. Yeah. Right. If you have Christ in you, and you know that you have Christ in you, which is the spirit of the anointing, right? Mm. You have Christos is the Greek word, the anointed one mm -hmm. in you, right? You have the anointing in you. Mm -hmm. Then when you begin to function and operate in the things of the Spirit, because God is Spirit, then you um, you have confidence, right? True. You know, the hope of glory, right? That's and, confidence. And could we add, today, tomorrow, and forever, Christ oh, yeah, is in me. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Even yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday as well. Let's not forget yesterday. <laughs> yeah. But Christ is in you, and uh, or he's in me. You know, we need to, to own it for ourselves. Sometimes we read these scriptures, and it's in the kind of the third person. Yeah. And we just kind of read over it, and we don't grab on to it, you know. Mm -hmm. we, we make the mistake of thinking... Especially in New Testament stuff, somehow it's for a different people or a different time. Yeah, yeah. But no, no, it's for you too. Yeah, it's for yeah. us as well. Right now, it was for them. <laughs> yes, and but it's also for you. Yeah, absolutely. Christ is in you, and Christ is perfect. Right, He's in your spirit. Uh, right. So you, we're perfect. Our spirit in the is spirit. perfect. Yeah, spirit. Yeah. Your spirit is perfect. Yeah. Now, the the challenge is, of course getting your soul and your body to function in the same with the same level of consistency as your spirit is operating right you know so that's when your mind bringing your mind which is in your soul into alignment with his mind right? yeah so that that you're functioning um, you know with the single purpose and intent right that's right in the things of God so if we could go back to that um, uh, eternal salvation graphic yep. and uh, we'll read um, uh, Curtis you want to read First John chapter 4 sure and we're reading from verse 13 down through uh, 18 all right first John 4 13 through 18 read along with us in your Bibles first John 4 13 through 18 hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Wow. Might as well read 19. Yeah. Well. And we love him because he first loved us. Yes. Yes. Amen. So you can see on that little graphic, it's talking about eternal salvation, because... Yep. Um, you know, we are in Him, and He is in us, right? And True. Um, so He's in us by His Spirit. So you see the dove there, uh, you know, this moving towards the heart, moving towards your heart. Yeah, so right towards this time Indicating yeah. that we are in Christ, and the Spirit of God is coming into us. Right? Amen. And He's doing that work in us. We don't have a little man. You know, standing in our chest. No, not literal. it's not a literal man, no. It's the Spirit of God Yes. Us, you know. Because it says that right here in this verse, in verse 13. Uh, and he in us because he hath given us of his Spirit. That's right. But we're also in God. Yeah. It's both. Yeah. Um, Jenny, would you like to read chapter 3, verse 24? Sure. Uh, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. 
And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Right. By the Spirit which he hath given us. Mm -hmm. So again, the, you know, it's flowing from the inside out, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of people are looking at uh, people's performance and their actions, but that's not how God is looking at you. Yeah. He's not looking at your performance. Which, that's a revelation to a lot of people. Oh, you're a bad boy or bad girl, right? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. He's not looking at your performance. God is speaking you, speaking to you spirit to spirit, because God is spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Right. So, um, uh, you know, another thing that I had been sharing, let's see here, I just want to make sure we don't go too long on this. Um, another thing that I was sharing was about the heart. Did you know that the heart is a well? It's the well of salvation yes. from which you will draw from. You know, like it's like uh, you know having one of those wells with the long rope, and you put down the bucket, and you wind it up, and you're drawing out of the well water. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Curtis, would you like to read um, Isaiah 12 and 3? In the Old Testament, um, you know, Isaiah prophesied uh, this, and then we're going to show you where Jesus uh, applies this in his conversation with the woman at the well. <laughs> Interesting yeah. enough. <laughs> All right, Isaiah 12 and 3. Yes, Let's yes. turn there. Isaiah 12, verse 3. It says, Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Why don't you read verse 4? Right, verse right four. down to the end. Of the okay, so 4, 5, and 6. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Right. Isn't there a chorus with that? There are several yeah. choruses. There's actually. lots of choruses there are here. About, I know about three choruses that are in these four verses. Yeah. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to try to sing them for you right now. But, um, uh, therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. That's one of the choruses. And um, so you're drawing water out of the well of salvation. So your heart is a well. Maybe if we could just put the big graphic back. Yeah. So it's just a little more noticeable if you can see it on the screen. That uh, your heart there is your spirit. And once you have Christ in your heart, Christ in you, the hope of glory, then you're drawing from that well of salvation to impact your soul, your body, and beyond. Right? Yes. Um, so Jesus was having the conversation with the woman at the well. Let's go over to first, uh, sorry, the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And uh, I think with this we'll probably uh, move on to talking about the kingdom. But um, in, in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and uh, so Jesus is uh, having this conversation with the woman. I don't know, Curtis, you want to read uh, from... Um, uh, maybe verse 1 right down to um, let's see well yeah I mean we could go on and on here mm -hmm. on this yeah it's where do you have yeah line. I could go right on down to 24 um, well it even goes further than that actually <laughs> so I don't know maybe we better just stick with the um, well, let's read, anyway, um, 13 and 14. Okay. Start there. That's All right, 13 and 14. Yeah. Yes. So John 4, 13 and 14. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, John 4, verse 13 and 14. Okay. Yeah. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, meaning the natural water, mm -hmm. shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Right. And that goes right along with the well of salvation in Isaiah 12. Exactly. Yeah. So, and verifying what 
Isaiah prophesied that you know you have a well of salvation in you and that you're drawing from the well of salvation that's your heart and um, you know this is springing up in you now you see this is like a fountain that is it's like the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the overflow of all of this and uh, Jenny, I'll get you to read uh, one more passage sure. here. I can't, I can't stop here. I've That's got, all right. Got to mm -hmm. go to John seven thirty seven to thirty nine. John seven thirty seven to thirty nine, because Jesus explains that it's going to be bigger than just a fountain spring. You know. <laughs> yeah. John seven thirty seven to thirty nine. Yeah. Um, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Spirit hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But, the, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Yeah. So uh, the newer translations, like the New King James says, out of your heart mm -hmm. will flow rivers of living water. Right. The old King James says, out of your belly, which mm -hmm. means out of the core of your being mm -hmm. will flow forth these rivers. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, this is coming from the well of salvation. It's coming yeah. from the fountain that's springing up unto everlasting life. That's right. You're going to have rivers of living water, which Amen. is what the graphic Amen. is trying to display there for you. Amen. And this well doesn't run dry. No. <laughs> no, there's no limit. No limit. And you're never going to thirst again. <laughs> All right. Exactly. So, unless you had something else to add to all of that, uh, I think... Well, I think it's really important that Christians realize you have Christ in you. You have the well in you. And sometimes we're crying out for more from God without the revelation that he's already deposited that well inside of us as believers. We have to draw from that. Draw from it. Draw from the it's well. It's not like God has to airdrop something from heaven for oh, you. Yeah. Like, he already put it in your spirit. Yeah, so we I have mean, a we lot of charismatic to... Pentecostal people go around, more, Lord, they're looking like, like God but, is going to drop it like rain on them. Yeah, okay? but the thing is, he already put the deposit in. Yeah, if you, you, have you to check the, bank the account. spirit of God, he's communicating to you spirit yeah. to spirit. Yeah. In fact, the only area of your life that is saved initially is your spirit. Right. Because the soul has to be you know, renewed. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 12. You know, transforming not to be of the conformed renewal. to this world. Don't be poured into the mold of this world. Be transformed by the but renewing of your, your mind, mind that you yeah. might prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that, that, that's all I would say is you just make sure you check what the bank account says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What the Bible yeah. says. <laughs> yeah. See, God has already made a deposit. <laughs> Your body has been purchased yeah. with the for the day of redemption, yeah. right? Um, you know, so the, the debate is, when do you receive the resurrected body? Do you receive it when the Lord comes, or do you receive it when you arrive in heaven? So that's a little bit of a debate that goes on there. But, I mean, ultimately, you will not receive the resurrected body until you either arrive in heaven or the Lord comes. Mm -hmm. Yes. To... We do know we're getting one, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We are getting a resurrected body. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the defined details of how may be up for debate. Mm -hmm. but... Yeah, yeah, that's right. In the end, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once we're in eternity, we're right. We're not going to care. <laughs> yeah. Amen. So we're going to come back to... Uh, focusing now on the kingdom of God and we've been reading Dr. Miles Monroe's uh, book on that and Mr. Curtis uh, Yes, we'll if you click on the, if you click on the link the other link on the, the description for this uh, Facebook live stream also later on it'll be on YouTube as well if you click on the link that says PDF book uh, it'll take you to Rediscovering the Kingdom by Dr. Miles Monroe then type in, uh, you, you should open that up into your browser or your uh, uh, Adobe uh, Reader. In the little box that gives you the page numbers, type in 243. That's where we stopped last time. That's for anyone with the e-book. All it says is kings have long arms. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, in the book, it actually has it on this page here. Okay. There you go. Yeah. 
And what's the picture in the background? Uh, it looks like a clam. Uh, a clam shell? It looks like a clam with a pearl. That's what it looks like. Yeah. A clam with a does. pearl. I guess because Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a treasure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So, um, kings, prophets, and the kingdom. There right, we go. Now we're on page 244. Okay. It's 181. It's 181. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell right. me what you like to yeah. Normally, when we talk about the kingdom of God, we think only of what Jesus said about about the subject as recorded in the four Gospels. Although it is certainly true that in his life and, and words, Jesus revealed the kingdom more fully than ever before. They were simply the culmination of all that God had been working toward from the beginning, as was his life in general. Everything God says and does relates to his kingdom. The entire Bible deals with the kingdom of God. From Genesis to Revelation, scripture reveals God as the great and almighty king of heaven and earth resolutely at work on his plan of the ages. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel, Exodus 19.6. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations, Psalm 22.28. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of, righteous, un, of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom, Psalm 45.6. They shall speak over the the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power Psalm 145.11 and in the days of those kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed and that kingdom will not be left for another people it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms but it will it, it, but it will itself endure forever Daniel 2.44 the plan is to reverse and destroy the works of the devil and fully restore his rule over the earthly realm through his human representatives. We have already said that the Bible is not about religion, but about a kingdom. Everything centers on the kingdom of God. All the saints of the Old Testament recognize this fact. Abraham knew it, Moses knew it, Samuel knew it, David the king of Israel knew it, the prophets knew it, Jesus knew it. All the apostles and other believers in the New Testament knew it. Everyone, it seems, understood the priority of the kingdom. Everyone except us, that is. <laughs> in recent years, the focus is much. The focus in much of the body of Christ has shifted away from the kingdom, of, kingdom of God to other issues. The tragic result is that multitudes of believers today know little about the kingdom, and even fewer understand their place and rights as citizens. That's true. Um, often, in spite of all our sophistication, education, and technology. We have modern and enlightened democratic societies are worse off than the people of Old Testament times when it comes to matters of understanding the kingdom of God and how our world relates to it. Which is ironic because we have more than they did. Yes. We have more access. Yes. But we have the Holy Spirit. And I mean, All to the add to that uh, mm -hmm. irony is that we have the Bible more right. available online and everything That's else. That's true. You can go to libraries, bookstores. On, it's on our phones. Uh, phones, tablets. You can. It's That's very true. easy to read the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. At least in this country. That's and true. And fewer people read it. And fewer That's people true. read it. Yeah. How weird is that? Yeah. It is yeah. weird. Amen. So, anything jump out there that uh, you're basically it's just basically agreeing. going through the Old Testament, revealing mm -hmm. that the kingdom of God has been, always been there. Mm -hmm. It's always been God's focus and plan. Yeah, I referred to that uh, Psalm twenty-two twenty-eight verse this morning. Oh yeah. Um, for the kingdom is the Lord's. Yes. And he rules over the nations, except the old King James says he governs the nations. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And I was referring to the fact that the Holy Spirit, which comes back to the, what we were sharing earlier, the Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom, right? Yeah. Jesus is at the throne of God. He's at the seat of authority, right? But the Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom. And so, in the King James, it says, rather than rules the nations, it says he governs the nations. That's really amazing. Yep. So, um, let's carry on then, Mr. Curtis. The king speaks about the kingdom. Yes. The king speaks about the kingdom. The book of Psalms is full of references that make it clear that David is a, and other psalm writers in Israel knew and revered God as king of kings. 
I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will give the, make the nations your inheritance, uh, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Psalm 2, 6-9. Not only do these verses speak of God as king, but they also look ahead prophetically to the coming of Jesus, uh, who would inherit the kingdom from his father. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. Psalm 10, 16. King David understood that human kingdoms are temporary, but God's kingdom is eternal. And they're on his land. Amen. Yeah, he owns the planet. Right. He owns the dirt. He owns the real estate. Amen. Uh, lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Psalm 24, verses 7 to 10. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as King forever. Psalm 29, verse 10. In these verses, David, Israel's second and greatest king, praised and acknowledged the Lord God as the King of glory who was enthroned forever. The world, sorry, the word glory literally means heavy or weighty, especially in the sense of referring to someone of great importance and high esteem. With the phrase king of glory, David exalts God as the greatest king of all and worthy of the highest esteem. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Psalm 45, verse 6. How awesome is the Lord most high? the great king over all the earth. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For the Lord, for the God, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. Psalm 47, 2, and also 6 through 8. These verses from psalms attributed to the sons of Korah speak of the throne of God from where he reigns over the nations and extends a scepter of justice. A scepter is a symbol of kingly rule and authority. Many earthly kings have raised over their subjects a scepter of cruelty and oppression. God's scepter, however, the defining characteristic of his rule is justice. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Psalm 103 verse 19. Uh, you, all you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through uh, all generations. Psalm 145, 10 through 13. It's not bolded, but it is a verse. Okay, I was just confused there for a second. Um, David, once again, was focused on the kingdom of God. Although he himself was a king, David knew his place. More than King Saul, who preceded him, and all the other kings who succeeded him, David understood his role not only as a king under God with civic obligations to his people, but also as a priest before God with spiritual responsibilities on behalf of his people. He is an example to us, all of us, to all of us of our place in the kingdom. Like David, we are called to rule as kings in this world, as well as to fulfill the priestly role of carrying out our spiritual care of the people in the earthly regions. Side note, that would be the order of Melchizedek, yeah. priesthood, which I'm not sure. We'll see if he mentions it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure he gets into that, but uh, you know, if you want to mention uh, that. Uh, Melchizedek was uh, had dual office of king and priest. Right? Yes, we think we think that David believed. Uh, we believe that David carried through that Melchizedek yeah. line yeah. Yeah. through to Jesus, and yeah. Jesus picked up the mantle. Yeah. yeah, So now he's the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. So the Melchizedek uh, priesthood is an office, right? Yes, it's an office like say the, the president of the United States or the prime, prime minister. minister of Canada. Yeah. I mean, it goes from one to the next, right? Yep. So, 
Um, okay, I don't know if you want to go on uh, more on that, or you want to. Uh, what are, is there anything else here? I mean, I, I mean, it says that he, the Lord, has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom yeah. rules over all. Psalm one hundred three, verse nineteen. Yeah. I mean. This is not even New Testament, and it's already saying his kingdom's on the earth. Yeah, absolutely. So for those that believe that the kingdom of God hasn't arrived yet, they haven't really done enough research. No. Because the kingdom of God is already here before Jesus got here. I mean, that's why we're reading the book. That's why we're reading the book. (laughs) But, I mean, God's already established his kingdom. Absolutely. All he wants to do is reconnect us to it. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Oh, I'm just going to... I think you read another one of those verses yeah, this morning. Yeah, I did morning. this morning. Yeah. yeah. One of the ones that Curtis read was Psalm 24. Yeah, I remember there. that. I yeah. Did that this yeah. morning as well. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> right. Okay, very good. Well, Jenny, if you want to continue on sure. with these ancient prophets in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Psalmists such as David and the sons of Korah were not the only people of the Old Testament of Old Testament times who understood the kingship of God and how the kingdoms of men are related to it. Many of the prophets also received powerful visions and insights into the glory and splendor of God and his kingdom. One of the most familiar of these visions is found in Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah (laughs) died, um, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I have and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah sixty one, one to five. It would be difficult to find a more powerful description, depiction of a king on his throne than Isaiah's picture of the Lord, surrounded by a host of angelic attendants who were ceaselessly praising him and hastening to do his bidding. Isaiah recognized immediately that he was in the presence of absolute holiness and glory. He had seen the king, the Lord Almighty, and the majesty of his vision so overwhelmed him that he feared for his life, his own Human sinfulness stood out suddenly in such starkness against the awesome purity and holiness of God that Isaiah expected to be struck down any moment. Instead, he experienced the the merciful justice of God. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Isaiah 6, 6 6 to 8. Isaiah's vision of God, the king, precipitated a spiritual crisis in his life. Once he had experienced the cleansing of his sin, the power of his vision inspired him to respond to the king's call. Isaiah became an ambassador for the Lord Almighty, called and appointed to proclaim the message of the kingdom of God to a wayward people who had ignored and rejected it. In another place, Isaiah recorded the insight he had received regarding the king's heir and the nature and character of his kingdom. For to us for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish will accomplish this, Isaiah 9, 6-7. What is the kingdom of God like? It is a realm ruled by a God who is mighty and everlasting and who is a wonderful counselor, a wise and just judge, a realm characterized by peace, justice, and righteousness. Jeremiah was another prophet who had profound understanding of the kingly nature and lofty status of God. He said, No one is like you, O Lord, you are great, and your name is mighty in power. Who should not revere you, O King of the nations? This is your due. Among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. 
But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal King. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure his wrath. Jeremiah 10, 6-7 and 10. To Jeremiah, God was the king of the nations, the true God, the living God, the eternal king, whom people of all the nations should revere and honor. As king, God set rightfully as judge of the earth, and under his wrath and anger, the nations could not endure. What a powerful picture of God. Jeremiah knew God as a king who was truly sovereign over his entire domain, both spiritual and physical. The strongest and most fearsome of human kingdoms are nothing in comparison to the kingdom of God. Yep. That's great, eh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. I was just looking at this uh, right, uh, right here. When Isaiah was having a spiritual crisis because he had seen the holiness of God mm-hmm. and he realized he was unclean, on clean lips, one of the seraphs came and flew to him with a live pole. Is that symbolic of Jesus? Is he the live pole? That, oh. That touched Isaiah. Is that symbolic of what Jesus would do to cleanse us? Well, I mean, you know, in the New Covenant, of course, it starts with the blood, right? Right. And uh, we know, even in the Old Testament, it says without shedding blood. So, but in this case, it's talking particularly about his lips, because he had been talking, you know, he said, I'm a, uh, a man of unclean lips. A man mm-hmm. of unclean lips. Yeah. He's talking specifically about his mouth and his words, right? Right. Um, so, you know... Um, to me, that's very similar to what John the Baptist said about uh, Jesus, that he would baptize with the Holy Ghost in fire. Right. Because the fire, or the coal, yeah. uh, will consume everything that's not of God. Yeah, that makes sense. So that would be more akin to the baptism in fire, then? Yeah. I, I would think yeah. it's simi- there's some similarity there. Yeah. Uh, but again, you know, one is Old Covenant, one's New Covenant. That's right. Well, even John the Baptist was, <laughs> when he was prophesying that, he was the last prophet in the Old Testament. He right? was, <laughs> so, even though he was recorded in the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, true. Yeah, he was um, the one that was the crossover. But look at, I mean, I, these are great passages. Yeah. He's calling out Jeremiah. He says uh, he's king of the nations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you see anything particular? Just very powerful. Yeah. And they, I mean, they would have had scripture, but not, these were inspired yeah, more yeah. than they read it. And, yeah. 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 Yeah, Jeremiah was inspired to write this. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. He wrote it by revelation. Yeah. yeah. Not by reading something. Yeah. So, um, we're going to read one more uh section here tonight and I think we'll uh, stop, we'll discuss it and have prayer because the next section really gets into uh, the Daniel uh, kingdoms and I think that we need more time next Mm -hmm. time to really get into that Mm -hmm. because you're going to be partially teaching Mm -hmm. about that. (laughs) So, but uh, the next section here talks about a kingdom uh, made not of human hands or by human hands so this actually is beginning to talk about that and uh, we'll introduce it but we'll get on talking then the the next section after that talks about Daniel and the king's dream I think we better hang on to that one until next time when we have oh yeah time. It's true. coming up towards 7.30 now. that's right so, yeah so let's go Curtis if you will to that la- uh, last section for tonight a kingdom made not by human hands Yes, a kingdom made not by human hands. Perhaps no one in the Old Testament received more revelation and insight about God's kingdom than did the prophet Daniel. That is true, I would say. And as a matter of fact, the entire focus of the book of Daniel involves the sovereignty of the kingdom of God over the kingdoms of men. Several times throughout the book, the strength of will and will of earthly kings are pitted against the strength and will of God, and God comes out on top every time. Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace could not touch the servants of God who were covered by his mighty hand. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the flames without even the smell of smoke on their clothes. The den of hungry lions was no match for the angel of God who shut their mouths and protected Daniel from being their next meal. <laughs> that made him... That made him... Uh, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a happy meal. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
right. Daniel was a member of the exile generation, those Jews who either were removed from their homeland by the Babylonians and forcibly relocated, or who were born in exile in Babylon. Even as a foreigner in, and in exile, Daniel rose to a position of great prominence and trust as a civic leader and administrator in the Babylonian government. He was a really sharp guy, a true intellectual, superbly educated and highly gifted as an administrator. In, these, in addition to these qualities, Daniel was a man of impeccable integrity, who loved God because of his extraordinary gifts and competence. Gifts and competence. Daniel directly served a succession of several Babylonian kings, these rulers wanted trustworthy men around them who could have found and could uh, and could have found no one better than Daniel. Okay. Yeah. So we're introducing uh, the book of Daniel. Did yeah. you want to actually read any scriptures out of Daniel uh, tonight? Well, I mean, we could just go back to um, sorry. Let me just look at Daniel quickly here. Yes, we could. Daniel 2 and 44. So Daniel 2 and 44 is a great one. Yeah. Daniel 2 and 44 says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This is following the dream. So yeah. the, the next section in the book here uh, will be dealing with that next uh, next time. That's right. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to in chapter 7? Of... I think in chapter 7 there was a great one there. Um, yeah, Daniel 7, 27 says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. All right. So, it, here we are prophesying several times, God is going to give an everlasting kingdom to the saints. Right. And we are his saints. And you see, in, earlier in that same chapter, 13 and 14, I mean, he, he has the vision of the Son of Man, right? Yeah. And I saw in, night, in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So this, is, this has to be the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. Look at verse 18 there. Yeah. Verse. Verse 18 says, And the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. Even forever and ever. Well, how long is that? Forever. Forever. <laughs> no expiry date. Nope. <laughs> it goes back to the eternal purpose of God. Yeah, exactly. The eternal purpose of God centers around the eternal kingdom. Right. So I believe that we have the kingdom of God downloaded into us when we receive the spirit of his son. Yes. Mm -hmm. he's, the, he's the king. Yes. We're receiving the spirit of his son crying, yeah. Abba, Father, you know. Amen. What's that verse that says the kingdom of God is within us? Uh, that's in Luke. Did you like to read that? Sure. That's in Luke 17, I think it's 20 and 21. Let me just uh, take a quick look. Uh, it's Luke 17. Yep. Uh, 20 and 21. Um, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So when we, re we receive the Spirit of Christ, you know, Christ in us, the hope of glory, when we are saved and uh, we receive Jesus into our hearts, you know, amen. We're also in God as well. Amen. And we're dwelling in Him and He in, he in us by the, the Spirit of His Son. Yeah. And so we have the spirit of the king in us. And he's making us kings and priests unto our God. Yeah. And we'll reign with him forever and ever. Praise God. Amen. Anything else before we pray? I think that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots to think about there. 
Okay. Oh, I see Kim is watching, and so is Gabby. So God blessings, bless you guys. Folks. Thank you for blessings, watching. Yeah. Blessings. So we're going to conclude in prayer. Father, tonight we thank you, Lord, that the kingdom of God is within us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have given to us a kingdom, and yes, we Lord. shall possess it forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that you will uh, continue to lead, guide, and direct us as we continue to uh, investigate, look into, um, desire, devour the word of God. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that the Spirit of God will lead us into all truth. So bless each and every one that has been watching tonight, Lord. Let them be encouraged by the things we have shared. Yes, Lord. And I pray, O oh God, that you'll continue to guide and direct us in the days ahead for the glory of Christ. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for those that have been watching and participating online tonight and for those that have been in house, Father, with us here in person. Lord, I thank you, Father, that your word is eternal. Your purpose is eternal, your kingdom is eternal, and all the way from the Old Testament we know that you were already had a kingdom and that your plan was to give it to the saints. And that, Lord, you want us to access the power of Christ or the power of the Spirit within our spirit. The, our soul can access it, Lord. So help us to process these truths, Lord. Help us to, uh, to learn these truths in our soul, that our soul may know, our mind may grasp, the things that you have made known in our spirit, Lord, that we may be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Lord, bless each one that, that has been participating and continue to encourage them, Lord, and empower them by the power of your spirit, because, Lord, they are inheritors of the kingdom. Uh, we are inheritors of your kingdom, Lord, and your kingdom is here now. The kingdom is within us, Lord, and, and uh, Lord, we bless you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this opportunity to meditate on your word and to learn and to grow. Um, I pray that those who listened um, have, have been blessed and um, I pray that you would keep us until the next time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we thank each of you for watching tonight. Yes, and thank you. We pray that you're encouraged and uh, take your Bible and look up some of these scriptures for yourself. Yep. And uh, you've got the PDF on there. You can continue to read and enjoy yeah. uh, the, the revelation that uh, Miles Monroe is sharing uh, in that book. Amen. So, God bless you. Thank you for watching. Blessings. Blessings.